life as a referee. Now, I, as a layman, not in the business, I realise that referees are also on the ring crew. Uh, so what uh, what total jobs would uh, the referee have? You know, what time would you get to an arena, let's say a house show arena? What would you oh, do yeah, before like, the refing? Yeah, I mean, you would drive the trucks. We were driving the trucks. Tony and Jim alive for 20-something years, 22 years. We uh, travelled and he ring announced and I refereed at the shows and we would drive the trucks all day, get there about 12, 1 o'clock for a live event, 12 o'clock noon. Um, if it was a bigger venue like Madison Square Garden, L.A. Staples Arena, Chicago or so, we'd get there earlier and, you know, set up the ring. And it would take a few hours to set up the ring in production and stuff. And then we'd go to lunch, come back and prepare for the show, ring announce, referee, and then tear down and then drive to the next city. Next city could be four, five, six hours away. And then uh, just do it all over again. At what time would you actually leave the arena? Because I imagine it's got to be way after the last match. At least uh, midnight, 1230. Because you'd have to, the last match with 1030, quarter of 11, sometimes 11 o'clock. And then by the time we we got the ring down, loaded up, it'd take to 1230 to get the ring in the truck. And then me and Tony were off with the ring truck, you know, to the next city. Yeah. Would you ever set up like the, the sets themselves or would there be a, uh, another crew to do all that? Not as different crews for different parts. Like we'd set the barricades and that and the ramp and so forth. And we'd do a little bit of everything. Back in the day, we did everything. Banners. We kind of did a lot. So it's just, uh, and then after a while, you had so many guys doing just banners and so many guys doing this. And then now there's the separate guys that do the stage, the ring. There's a, it's like um, a certain, you know, a certain um, set of guys for a certain part of everything. Right. Well, Whether it's it. stage, ramp, ring, you know, ring, barricades. Pyro, obviously. Pyro, yeah, <laughs> they don't do the pyro that much anymore, though. <laughs> They need to come back with the pyro, that's for sure. Zenith Pyro used to do our pyro for many years, and they, they kind of let them go many years ago. Yeah, I suppose when fans get back in. Yeah. It'd be, it'd yeah. be more worth it doing then. Definitely, definitely. Right, I'm going to give you, you probably, you've probably you probably answered this one a million times before, but the yeah. first match you ever officiated, and how scared were you? Um, I was I was real nervous, real nervous. But I had, I had two guys that were... You know, good guys way back. And, it was, and I don't know if you remember, like, the Brooklyn Brawler. Of course. I just interviewed and, him a few weeks ago, in fact. Did you really? I really wow. did, yeah. Great. Lovely guy. So, yeah, like, uh, Brooklyn Brawler and uh, Barry Horowitz was my first match, man. And he would, Barry Horowitz and, you know, the Brawler were definitely, like, uh, entertainers. Hmm. And that Barry Horowitz, he was a hell of a worker, too. So, I mean, you know, and he was fun to watch. And, you know, so it, it's, um, it was, I was very nervous, but those guys helped me out taught me a lot and Joey helped me out in the ring, you know, just helped me out with, you know, during the day we'd go over stuff and the wrestlers would help you out if they liked you. And, and I had, I had a lot, a lot of knowledge came from all old school wrestlers, you know, with me. So it came with a lot of old school wrestlers, which really helped me in my career. Yeah. Um, with matches. And I don't know if this changes over the years when you get more senior, but um, would people actually come to you? I mean, obviously if you were like involved in a certain portion of the match other than the counting would they come to you for advice of uh if you know you're going to get knocked down in the match would you in put your input into a match oh yeah definitely definitely got to put my input into it um and you know definitely would they would ask an experienced referee like charles robinson myself and chad Patton or you know john cone or somebody like that you know and you have to because you have to take it from a referee standpoint of view what's going to look best for the match you know and so i mean that's what you know with, Watching AEW is a little hard, man, because they just, as a referee, you know, and I love all the guys and the talent that I know so many talent, and it's great to watch this new talent like Darby and a lot of these other guys and Orange Cassidy and this upcoming, and, you know, the Young Bucks. And, but it's just hard to watch as a referee because they just jump all over the referees, man. It's just, uh, you know, the referees are there for the pinfall and they, they just acknowledge the tag in. That's it. You know, there's no five counts in the corner, no 10 counts outside, or it's kind of just run all over the referees at times. But, you know, I, I hope they tighten that up just as a referee standpoint, hmm. you know. I, um, I'm i going to give you this one, right? So what is, and I pretty much know what the wrestlers' pay structure will be like maybe in the 80s and 90s and then guaranteed contracts and everything um, afterwards and downsides. What was the pay structure like for a referee coming in? Would you have a certain amount of dates uh, like the wrestlers? Yeah, you'd have a certain amount of dates as a referee, especially if you did ring crew, you were definitely at the show. So you would referee that show. Um, JR and 
back in the eighties and nineties, referee pay scales were great. Phenomenal. Um, like if, say, if we did London, I would get 3000 for London American dollars, you know, for, for, um, it would be London, um, Berlin, all the major cities that, you know, like if we went to Sydney or Melbourne or, and big cities like that on a Europe tour, those would be the highest paid, but the boys were making a lot more than that. So, I mean, if the boys, if I was, if the referee was making way back then in the eighties, nineties, 3,000, 2,500 a night, the boys were making 10 grand, eight grand a night. And then you had the top guys making more money. Hmm. So, the- you know, base scales were good because I mean, when I seen the uh, dark side of the ring or warrior and a bunch of guys in Dino Bravo, they were buying million dollar houses in the eighties and nineties. <laughs> I was like, wait, where is some of that money? But remember, the referees can't get, they don't, they don't get paid for dolls. They don't get any dolls in the WWE. Um, they can't have any shirts. They can't, they can't get paid for video games or nothing. They won't put us on the video games. So it's kind of tough, you know. And I don't know why they do that. So mm. with um with like the midnight and stuff like when times are a bit lean, would you be um like slipped into the talent pool pay or something like that, you know, just to shore up your wages? If a, if a, you know, a house was a bit low. Uh, yeah. I mean, definitely if the house was low, you wouldn't get paid as much, you know, you definitely, I mean, there's times that you're getting paid 500 bucks a night to travel around the world. And it's like, wow, after taxes and the money you spend before you know it, you're making 150 bucks a night, you know? Hmm. So, I mean, um, yeah, definitely when, you know, when, when business was bad, we used to feel it in the pockets too. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, uh, you know, actually, you preempted another question I was going to ask was uh, about royalties. So you mentioned, obviously, WWE Network. That they don't really give many royalties to anyone, I don't think. Um, but uh, I asked this Don Morocco, actually, and he said, apart from Hulk Hogan, who had a special deal, maybe Roddy Piper, and obviously yeah. Jesse Ventura, who sued for it, Mr. Fuji also sued successfully and got a payout for um, royalties and stuff. But that doesn't stretch to... Uh, so does that not stretch to, like, commentary or refs or anything like that ever? No, refs don't get it, period. So, I mean, that's, that's the thing. Maybe they shortened his paycheck, uh, Mr. Fuji's paycheck for a while. They gave him the right percentage or something at that time. And so, and, you know, they figured it out, but maybe sued him for that. But, I mean, the referees don't even get a chance to get royalties. So, and they're the least paid. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. On the show. I'm going to give you another one here. Do referees have uh, uh, groupies? I'm sorry. Do referees get groupies on the? I don't know when you got married, so this oh, might have to be no, a fictional no. question. Oh no, well, no, it's all right. Back in the day, there was tons of groupies. I mean, I'll call it. There were tons of girls out there. It was fun, man. You know, like um, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun because it it kind of faded away after the years. So, but in, there was nothing like the '80s and '90s and early 2000s. So I'll tell you that. Yeah, I'll agree. Uh, uh, not not not, not for the groupies. I'll just agree for watching it. <laughs> UK was fantastic, believe me. Everywhere we went, man, we were, whether it was Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, here, there. I mean, just, it was it was phenomenal, you know? Did the referees ever have to take drug tests? Yes. Did they really? Them. Yes. Oh, my God. Sons of bitches, man. They used to get <laughs> us. So, yeah, we took drug tests. And we used to get tested for uh, marijuana, too. And that's one thing I used to like to enjoy. Like, when you're on the road, I probably smoked a lot more than I drank because... You got in trouble when you drank and you didn't want to drink too much, waking up in hangovers. Marijuana was my thing, you know, and it would calm you down at nights and put you to sleep from long days and long nights. And a lot of guys did, but we would get fined 2,500 bucks American if we failed it. So we wouldn't get suspended for marijuana, but, and the drug tests were a good thing to take because a lot of the pills and, and heavy drugs out there. And, you know, a lot of guys could, or start do a lot of things around when you travel around the world. But, um, and I thought the drug testing was very good, you know, because it would take care of, like, make sure the boys don't have a pill problem for pain and so forth. But the marijuana, they used to take our money, 2500 bucks a pop. <laughs> I was going to say, so did you give up or did you just pay the weed tax? Oh, you had to pay it, man. It was like, you know, once you took the drug test, you get the letter, you're like, shit, you know, and then all of a sudden <laughs> you wouldn't see a check, check or two coming in for a while. It's like, oh, it's like you're working for free. <laughs> so yeah, that hurt the pockets a little bit, but you kept you in, it kept you sane. Mm. That's for sure. 